There are almost the same number of men named John in the House of Lords as there are non-white peers. <laughs> Thank you, and with that, I put the motion before the House that this House believes the House of Lords does not, is not fit for purpose, and I look to the Social Events Officer, Oriel College, to open the case for the proposition. Good evening, honoured members and guests. Thank you, Mr President, for the incredible honour of speaking here this evening. And congratulations to the whole officer team on what has been an amazing term so far. The House of Lords has gone by many titles over the years. In 2017, it was known as the best daycare centre for the elderly in London. Clement Attlee described it as like a glass of champagne that has stood for five days. And Walter Beijot said that the cure for admiring the House of Lords is to go and look at it. When the House of Lords was briefly abolished in 1649, it was because it was deemed useless and dangerous to the people of England. Clearly, the House of Lords has been unpopular for a long time. And yet in this time, what has changed? The House of Lords has become less powerful. It has lost some of its hereditary peers. And yet its structure has become ever more bloated and ineffective and ever less serving of the people. But before I get into the substance of my argument, it is my duty and my pleasure to introduce the speakers of the opposition. First, we have Sylvan Bennett Shah, our Director of Innovation. It is appropriate that Sylvan is speaking on that side of the debate. Despite his title, Sylvan is known for his love of the aristocracy, opera music and tweed, our Director of Tradition, some might say. Second, we have Lord Kakar, Emeritus Professor of Surgery at University College London and a life peer. He has a very impressive list of achievements with three degrees, multiple chairman positions, and is currently the chancellor of Lincoln University. And finally, Lord Billamoria, esteemed businessman, member of the House of Lords and chancellor of Birmingham University. Again, a surprising backer of tradition, considering that the University of Birmingham was only founded in 1900. It's been around for less time than the House of Lords has been made fun of. And for those of you who are interested, Yes, Oxford was founded before the House of Lords. Mr. President, those are your speakers and they are most welcome. I'd like to begin by setting out what this debate is about. This is not a debate over the benefits of bicameral compared to unicameral systems and whether we should elect the House of Lords. My side of the House is under no obligation to provide an alternative to the current system, although some of us will. To provide a winning argument tonight, all we must do is prove to you, the members, that under the current system, the House of Lords is unfit for purpose. So to begin, what is the purpose of the House of Lords? Originally created as a legislating body in the 13th century, the House of Lords has gradually given up supremacy to the Commons and taken on the role of scrutiny. The House of Lords has no power to block legislation from the Commons, so what is its purpose and do we even need a second chamber? The answer has to be yes. 55% of amendments to legislation are tabled by the House of Lords, who are free to debate laws for as long as they like, can table as many amendments as they like, and, in theory, have the expertise necessary to make valuable contributions to legislation. The lack of electoral pressure means that the House of Lords ought to be free to take a long-term view on legislation, rather than trying to win votes by promoting irresponsible schemes. Thus, the purpose of the House of Lords is to check the power of the House of Commons by considering the non-political angles of legislation and giving their expert advice. Well, that is the theory. In practice, the House of Lords is full of political appointees who all too often don't fulfil this purpose. They are not experts, they do not scrutinise legislation, and they do not serve the taxpayers who subsidise them. The main barrier to the House of Lords being fit for purpose is the way that its members are appointed, and their continued dysfunction is eroding trust in politics with dangerous consequences. Liz Truss appointed one life peer for every one and a half days she spent in office. <laughs> not a high bar, admittedly. David Cameron appointed 243 in total, an average of 40.5 each year. With members appointed for life, it is no wonder that the House of Lords is one of the largest chambers in the world, and one of the only remaining chambers 
to have both hereditary peers and religious figures automatically take seats. The only other country where religious figures automatically take a seat is Iran. This is a consequence of the half-finished reforms of 1999, which removed most of the hereditary peers and has replaced them instead with political nomination. In recent years, this has included the son of a KGB spy, former, former special advisor Charlotte Owen, whose experience page from the House of Lords simply says, no experience information to show, and a striking number of former politicians and party donors. There is no limit on the number of peers that a prime minister can create and very limited mechanisms through which appointments can be blocked. Even advice from MI5 is apparently not enough to stop prime ministers from creating peers. This creates a system which is dominated by ex-politicians. 55% of those created peers by the government since 2013 are ex-staffers, ex-politicians or ex-candidates. What expertise do these people have to scrutinise our laws? And why should we be paying for politicians to give their friends a job for life that has a £361 allowance just for showing up? That's more than some people with universal credit get each month. The House of Lords is dominated by the same parties that create eternal conflict in the Commons, except for the fact that they are not held accountable to the people. The Conservatives have a majority in the House of Lords, and due to peerages being for life, the only way Labour can get around this is to appoint more peers themselves, bloating to the chamber to the point of ridicule. The system of appointees also results in a House of Lords that is not representative of the British people. Less than 30% are women, 57% attended private school, the average age is 71, and only 6% come from a minority ethnic background. No, thank you. There are almost the same number of men named John in the House of Lords as there are non-white peers. <laughs> this is not a house which is capable of appreciating the needs of modern Britain. The appointment system means that all too often, those appointed to the House of Lords are only interested in the prestige and not in the act of governance. In 2022, 13% of Lords had attended rarely or never since 2015, and 58 had not attended at all. Those with political connections can pay their cronies for a position in the House of Lords and then fail to do any of the work associated with the job. Their life promotion at expense of the taxpayer fulfills no purpose except for their own advancement. This is also, crucially, eroding trust in politics. Scandals such as the PPE scandal involving Baroness Moan and her £20 million profit, and the fact that donors of over £58 million to the main political parties have been appointed to the House of Lords in the last 10 years, contribute to the growing public perception that a seat in the House of Lords can be bought. Out of the Conservative Party's 20 biggest donors since 2010, over half of them have been given an honour or a title. As public trust in government is at an all-time low, something must be done to ensure that our government can continue to function in a way that is both honourable and effective. Crossbenchers currently make up less than a quarter of those in the House of Lords. If the House of Lords Appointment Committee were given more power to appoint those with real expertise and the government was blocked from appointing peers at will, the House of Lords could fulfil its purpose of scrutinising legislation sent to it by the Commons. The House of Lords could be populated by public figures with a term limit, appointed on the basis of their contributions rather than their donations. The government ought to be more inclined to listen to experts suggesting amendments rather than failed politicians, but the House of Commons would retain its supremacy, thus avoiding the gridlock seen in America. Ultimately, the purpose of the House of Lords is to create better laws. Under the current system, it's become a mockery of a chamber filled with old chums, has-beens, and those with deep pockets. Bloated, expensive, and ineffective, for too long, the House of Lords has been used by politicians to ennoble their friends and allow the easy passage of bills through a dormant house. We must change this. The House of Lords must become non-partisan, must be populated by those who can contribute to the law in a meaningful fashion, and must be held more accountable to the people. 
As it stands, it is not fit for purpose. Thank you.